we got backward compatible. It's the end of an era as Jim, Doc, Chris, and Nick bid farewell to the podcast. In parting, we share our personal tips and advice for games analysis and criticism so that you can stay compatible in our stead. Plus, where you can find the show moving forward and reflections on our time as hosts. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast concludes right now. Listeners, welcome to episode 134 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Nick. Hey, everybody. <laughs> and unfortunately, Eric wasn't able to join us, but he sends his regards. Uh, listeners, I'm sorry to say that this is actually going to be our final episode of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Wait, what? <laughs> yes. It's the end of an era. You're um, telling me this way? <laughs> yeah. Doc, Wait, Doc Chris, you only... just sprung this on us in the middle yeah. of like, the beginning of the recording. <laughs> the Doc is just now finding out. Uh, <laughs> it's no, lies. Surprise. It's dirty, dirty lies. <laughs> no, we've... Uh, this we've is been... the last episode of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia? Yes, it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That was impressive, Nick. <laughs> For now, at least. Yeah, who, who knows what the future holds. But we uh, we were sort of taking a look at uh, our different life situations, and uh, we were finding that uh, a lot of stuff has changed for all of us in the time since we started um, you know, back, back then, uh, Jim and I were still in grad school, doc, you were, uh, still teaching UTD. True, true. I um, was in high school. Yeah. Nick was in high school. So that's terrifying actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit terrifying. Uh, and we just kind of got to this point where, um, we just weren't able to, uh, keep this up in the same way we used to. Yeah. It's all um, because our Patreon account never got funded. That, that Mostly was because it. our Patreon account never got, uh, created. <laughs> um, that Kickstarter never got funded either. Yeah, yeah. That too. The one we never did. <laughs> and so, uh, we decided it was time to move on and invest our time and other creative pursuits. And so uh, this definitely isn't the last you're going to hear from us. Uh, we're going to have uh, plenty of other things we're going to keep doing. Yeah, don't uh, get too excited. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's not a it's not a see you never. It's a see you over there. Exactly. Um, so first of all, just to kind of talk logistics, what's going to end up happening with the cast uh, at the time of recording. We are currently in late September. And our plan is to keep hosting the podcast, uh, keep the RSS feeds up and running uh, through the end of the year, through the end of 2018. So in January 2019, we'll go ahead and let the RSS feeds um, expire. Uh, however, in that meantime, we're going to be uploading all of the episodes to YouTube. Uh, so YouTube is going to be the place henceforth, at least until YouTube dies in a fire and we move to something else, which we'll let you know. <laughs> but um, I mean, that'll probably be pretty soon. So we'll yeah, have to I, come up with a backup plan. I look forward to that day. <laughs> but um until that happens everything will be available on youtube um permanently and for free uh so you can go check that out anytime uh we're also going to continue uh with roll with it at least for the time being we've got two more seasons that we have yet to publish so that's we're gonna our get... actual play show if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with it there's a ton of content you've never heard <laughs> uh so we're going to keep that going publish a couple of seasons possibly uh keep going with a few unplugged uh sort of see how that goes it could end up being something that we end up hosting uh, kind of either on its own maybe it ends up being um, something where we just keep having new content on the same YouTube channel that we're going to be archiving backward compatible could be um, maybe it's something that we do on the Doc and Kruger cast uh, which is something the Doc and I will definitely continue to do uh, that's the official podcast of our uh, games partnership uh, yes. where we make role playing games other tabletop games and who knows maybe we will have guests like perhaps Jim and Nick yeah. and Eric 
all all the folks. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll just have to see how that goes. But uh, what we're going to end up doing as well is we're probably going to revamp the website so that backward-compatible.com will remain on the internet. You'll be able to go there and you'll probably find a landing page that will sort of tell you where to find us, what's going on. Um, so some basic information and, you know, pointing you to our YouTube channel, that sort of deal. Yeah, look for that. We're, we're definitely going to be um, updating it more, a little bit more streamlined and you'll still be able to find all of our content. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we will be around. And uh, of course, you can find each of us on uh, social medias if you so desire. So yeah, no, we look forward to seeing Not me. You. I'm going completely off the grid. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, Jim is just uh, packing up and riding off into the sunset. Jim is actually the reason we were canceling this yeah. show. Actually. I'm, I'm because just, he I'm just wanted to stop. Yeah. <laughs> the undisclosed location from three seasons ago, you're going back? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wow. Uh, the time travel was all in preparation for, <laughs> but we wanted to go ahead and uh, make this last episode kind of a celebration of the cast and also to leave you uh, with a few sort of tips and advice that we wanted to share um, so that you can kind of keep doing what we've been doing in our stead. So yeah, steal our show. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Backward compatible 2.0. Yeah. The, uh, if, we're gonna be if you are going to steal our show, though, uh, make sure that you actually market it because that's something that we never did. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> make Back it more famous than us and just give us a royalty or something. There, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Backwards dot compatible. <laughs> uh, so it, the, it's free to use, but there is an attribution license on the uh, trademarked backward compatible method, uh, which we'll be sharing here in this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In all seriousness, though, we're going to be talking about um, how it is that we kind of approach uh, games criticism, things that we've kind of learned throughout our time as uh, podcast hosts and what takeaways we could share with you that you might be able to apply in your own thinking and your You're own here. future gaming. But first, we want to go in and share some favorite moments from the show, some reflections on the podcast. Uh, so does anyone want to open up with that? Uh, sure. I'll, I can start, I guess. Um, I have a lot and most of my stuff is pretty general, to be honest. But um, a few few of the specific um, moments that stood out to me, uh, in particular, the uh, Roll With It episode where uh, I believe it was a Halloween show and all of us were um, goblins. Goblins, yeah. yeah. Goblin Quest. Yeah. Goblin, Goblin Quest, Quest yeah. that's it. Brian um, McKittrick was our GM. Exactly. Um, I had a lot of fun running that. It, it was a... Um, very kind of like a lighthearted game. We didn't, none of us really took it that seriously, but I actually thought that the um, storytelling in it was pretty solid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, and I believe we all had a good time. So it was more, it wasn't really so much a critical examination of anything. It was just, just fun. And that was a, that was a pretty powerful moment, I think. Yeah. I, I got to say that one of my favorite things that we have done is the actual play um, to, mm -hmm. to be able to get online and, and see people playing their role-playing games and uh, listen to it and that sort of thing. That's pretty easy to do. There's a lot of actual play uh, content up there. L a lot of it is uh, what you would consider to be typical. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it is um, very long. Right. Some of it is um, incredibly good. Uh, you know, I, I would point to, I, I just lost it. Oh, um, so Geek and Sundry's published a few things, Titan's Grave, um, which is less like a typical actual play show. That's more of like a produced series. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Critical Role is very popular. That's a weekly uh, Dungeons and Dragons live stream. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess my point I think is... Dan Harmon did something similar too, right? Where right, he played right. played D&D with some friends. And mm -hmm. The idea is that there's a spectrum here, though, and that's right. between we just hit record and don't worry about anything and throw it up there versus a highly produced show. And, and I think we've tried to do a highly produced show. And of course, our spinoff has been, um, you know, the unplugged stuff. But I think some of the most fun we've had is whenever we've just hit record and been like, okay, let's see what happens. And, you know, there's there's a few things that um, never made it, <laughs> never made it to air, shall we say. <laughs> but uh, I think some of the things that we have put up have just been some of my favorite role play experiences ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really I echo that, Jim. I think that some of the, um, the role with it stuff that we've done is great, especially the time travel um stories we've had two or three and, and, yeah, we, and we've still got one fun. that's that's not um been put out yet mm -hmm. uh so it will be eventually it, it <laughs> will be but um i'm excited about that one because it's going to be full orchestral accompaniment right nick <laughs> right uh, that electronic one. but yeah yeah well fair enough yeah yeah i've been looking forward to to that one as well that was i believe um was it will that will parsons yeah, was yeah, the will on that one. one yeah, yeah. and uh, worth noting we use those examples for our um roll with it system the mm -hmm. actual system itself mm -hmm. so um I think that that closes the loop, shall we say, on on that particular system and everything that uh, we used it for with the podcast, the audio book, the book, all of that stuff. So, you know, we could not have done that without um, everybody 
who participated in uh, testing the role with it system. And of course the show, absolutely seminal. So, but I agree with you, Jim. I think that, I think that roll with it is uh, one of the best, coolest, most amazing things we've done. And and there's for sure going to be an archive of that one. It's going to stay forever. Mm-hmm. That was, that's one of mine. Um, some of the other stuff that, that I really enjoyed, I feel like um, just sort of in general, I like the different voices that I feel that are different perspectives mm-hmm. that uh, we've all kind of brought to the show. Um, I've had some pretty fun arguments with uh, Chris, I feel, <laughs> um, sometimes. And, uh, of course, all in good fun. Plenty of rules lawyer. Yeah, lawyering. you guys never right. get to see Chris's expression. <laughs> <laughs> um, we all get to yeah. see that and enjoy we, that. We had one in particular when we used to record um, um, in the – in. Um, oh, geez. I think it was, in, it was in the office, wasn't it, I want to say, where – um, I really got into it. I forget even what I was arguing about with Chris. Yeah, but I oh, made, it was um, I it made was some, art. Was yeah, it over the game, definition games of art. Games, yeah. oh, was that the one where I was like, ma- I used a shoe as a metaphor? Yeah, you did. I, I used the shoe as a metaphor. You used the shoe. Okay, yeah. right. And we started <laughs> like somehow we had a shoe as a metaphor, and it was I, like. So a, what happened is I declared that this was art. <laughs> okay, right, right. <laughs> Insert to, clip here to make the point that like because I was making the argument that if someone declares something is art, it, right. can, it becomes art. Not necessarily good art, but right. technically speaking, <laughs> art. Uh, and so that's just one of the uh, the many examples of the sort of back and forth over like right. what defines art what doesn't also the declaration of something as art yes. is art yes <laughs> no that was that was a lot of fun and i and one thing y'all have probably learned about me over the years is uh i like arguing so if someone <laughs> brings something up it doesn't really matter if i actually feel that way i'll i'll just jump on it and start arguing yeah i actually enjoy it so <laughs> it, it it becomes a whole thing for me uh but yeah that was i thought that was that really was really audience. interesting you know i i like i like painting but it doesn't mean i'm good at painting there you go. Um, but you and it like, doesn't mean that other people enjoy your paintings right exactly there you go. actually my paintings are awful my sculpture is better <laughs> but jim you you like arguing and you're good at arguing and that in and of itself becomes a spectator sport and an art yeah. so I, that there you go uh but Full yeah circle. those those were those were a lot of fun for me um just just hearing the different perspectives and uh um Chris's very zen-like neutrality most of the time <laughs> uh, I found very impressive uh, I, I, there was more than a few occasions where I have to admit I was trying to rattle Chris like could I could I shake him out of that zen-like a moment and nope couldn't do it I've been trying to do it for 21 years <laughs> yeah. it hasn't worked the, the perks of being the brother uh, but yeah you know uh, there was one time when we defined our roles mm-hmm. um, and I think that I said I was like the nutty professor mm-hmm. and uh, Chris declared himself the mediator yeah. and uh, Jim I think you said something like uh, the the provocateur sh- provocateur yeah. that's yeah. it that's what it was I was gonna say the shaker upper but that yeah. wasn't it. <laughs> um, but I, you know I, I love that um, that dynamic that we have always had um, and of course you know Nick has been in every single episode uh, in one form or another, because his work has been in every single episode. Right. And so, um, in, in this sense, he has the, the perfect attendance record that I don't even have. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> that Chris um, doesn't even have surprisingly. Nope, I know. No, it's true. It's true. No, actually that's, that's something that, I'll, uh, definitely. Although I if you're stretching that, Chris maybe has been in every episode because he edits all he of edits them. It, he edits it. Yeah. <laughs> Producers yeah, are so artists. Yeah, if, if it's your work, in fact, I've been actively working. Sometimes Nick's music is there, but it's passive because he made it and it's just included. It's right? true. So, it's just a cut true. and paste job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I will Actually, say that. I've been making tweaks to every time, every time the back yeah. compatible. <laughs> Uh, theme song i've made tweaks every time if you listen carefully you can tell that this note was off by just a fraction of a second (laughs) isn't that the same argument vanilla ice made whenever he stole work is it yeah yeah it is Uh, is. i thought so you know he he literally made the argument one time that uh, you know uh ice ice baby was not uh stealing because instead of going dun 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 it went dun 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 It's from uh, Under Pressure, right? Yeah, well, Under Pressure. He, he yeah. sampled that bass line, though. It's not the same as stealing. It's oh, sampling. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, that, that concludes our discussion on what is art. <laughs> no, but the, uh, I think the, the... I won't get into copyright law right now. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. You, no, I've been yeah, interrupting you. No, yeah. Just, I, just the, uh, the production value, I think, that y'all, y'all brought to it with the editing and the music. Um, something you don't really think about when you're recording the show, but when yeah. you go back and listen to it, it added a professionalism. Thousands that, of man hours. Thousands right, of man hours. Right. Man. And I, I feel like it's it's the sort of thing that a lot of, of podcasts don't have 
So it was pretty exciting to yeah. kind of hear that level of professionalism and something that I was involved in. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I complained whenever I had to cart around the equipment because there's like four <laughs> bags worth of equipment that I have to cart everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. And the location where we, you know, do the recording has changed, but, uh, you know, the stuff has improved and gotten heavier and heavier. And we went from one microphone to four bags. And I was like, man, I got so much work to do. It's just not <laughs> fair. And then these guys go home and they, and they create music and they edit for hours and hours on end. Uh and whatever it is you do, Jim, I don't know. I, I just show up. Oh, yeah. I just show up. That's that's it. Sometimes I don't even do that. He goes Actually, on Twitter and then he shows up with the stuff that he read on Twitter. There you go. <laughs> Actually, to be fair, and I say this in all honesty, I think some of our best ideas for shows have come from you, Jim. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, you always have something out of the box or, uh, you know, you've got this article that needs to be read or whatever it is. And that has just been so cool to have this thing to react to cold and go, I don't know anything about this situation but my opinion is <laughs> and it's been uh you know really it's it's kept me on my toes for this uh you know these last five years mm -hmm. especially since i haven't been active in uh games academia uh you know it's it's actually kept me my brain on in the video game world and that's just been cool so i thank you for that on a personal level i thank you well you're welcome <laughs> All right, enough, enough, enough. So for the next hour, we're just going to say thank you, sure. Anna. <laughs> no, thank what, you. So what do you, what do you, um, do you have, do you have anything, Chris? Uh, do you kind of pass it over to us? Yeah, but. sort of looking back at stuff, I think um, a lot of my favorite episodes, uh, some of the ones I would go back and re-listen to even after having edited them. Uh, and of course, this isn't always right away. Sometimes it's after a few months or even after a couple of years. I actually remember at one point when I was working um, at a community college uh, doing the night shift. I had lots of time to just listen to podcasts. I actually, at one point, just listened through um, our entire uh, chronology uh, yeah, from episode yeah. one up to whatever it was at the time, um, because I would be walking around the campus just like sort of checking to make sure the doors were locked and the projectors were off and all that different stuff. And uh, so I had basically like 40 minutes every evening of just walking around and doing that. So mm -hmm. um, I worked through our entire podcast and I think some of my favorites are the ones where we did mix in that sort of splash of academia um, where either we're sort of, um, you know, sort of teaching or sharing the sorts of stuff that we've already learned um, or exploring new ideas that we're actually exploring ourselves. Uh, trying to define things was always kind of fun. Um, I think I mentioned on a previous cast when we were talking about favorite episodes, like going all the way back, I think, to episode three, uh, where we were talking about um uh, avatars and characters and caricatures and wow. sometimes we would come up with like you know, new names for things uh, we tried to define oh, it right I remember that um, all yeah. the different types of like revamps and sequels mm -hmm. and reimaginings <laughs> and like what the differences there were um, having some guests on who are able to share uh, like very advanced knowledge that none of us have I think is like kind of in the spirit of academia is yeah. uh, learning from other people on the show yeah we've had some cool people on the show mm -hmm. absolutely really have some some people that have gone on to great and powerful things mm -hmm. Um, especially due yeah. to their association with the show, of course. Of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> we we launched them into internet fame. Yeah. yeah. Where would Uncle Fergus be today if not? Where is he now? I don't even know. I was also a huge fan of um, our roundtables or codexes where we were sort of able to just dig into a particular game or a series. Yeah. Uh, I think back, for example, to the uh, Metal Gear Solid talk that you and I had, Jim, at one point. Mm -hmm. um, the Persona Five Table for Two that we did. Um, very recently, the Doki Doki Literature Club Roundtable, I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, I dare you to find anybody who has discussed that deeper than you guys have discussed those <laughs> particular examples. I, I'm sure they exist, but <laughs> well, <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't and, think and of that's, anything. And that's my thing is that, you know, you'd, you'd have to go digging for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, the ones that I... Mean, I you have to go digging for us, to be fair. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Not if they're you, listening right now. <laughs> that's right. We, when, when you look at some of our, our best episodes, the ones that are, the, you know, the top episodes with the most listens, they tend to be the ones that are... Um, very specific and very specialized. And that shows me that people are looking for things and that, that they're finding our voice and our opinion on those things and that, that we have contributed in some way mm -hmm. to, um, you know, the, the body at large. This is the greater discourse. In yeah, sense, that, yeah, that's that's the way to say it um, or a way to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, I mean, the idea that there's only a few podcasts or a few voices or whatever, that's silly. I don't think anybody thinks that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, instead, there is this huge din of information that, that goes out there. And, and for us to be able to contribute, you know, if, if for example, the, the creators of No Man's Sky happened to catch our review during the time when things were, 
mm, rough <laughs> and listen to our uh, slightly less angry discourse on and, and actual suggestions on how the game could be improved, we could never prove this. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, as we look at the next update and things that have come out since then, um, I think that a lot of the things that we called for, um, a lot of the improvements that we said we wished were there, those have come about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that some of that is just that, you know, we kind of have a good sense for games and game design and kind of like yeah. in a very practical sense, like what could be done to improve upon something. And so I think that solid designers out there are probably going to follow maybe not the exact same way that we thought. Great but minds think relatively alike. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm taking credit for it. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm I, fixed I agree. No Man's Sky, everyone. I, think I, they I called you a great mind, the show. How do you feel about yeah. that? I think they listened to the show. They got I'm a lot of ideas. <laughs> they took notes. And uh, they made improvements, and I think we should get a little bit of a little bit of a cut. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Exactly. Yeah. We'll kick back. Uh, but no, in all, in all seriousness, I think it's um, it's incredibly fun to be able to contribute to the conversation, the ongoing uh, sort of archive of thought during a specific time. Uh, if you if you go back the four or five years when the show started, and you you look at some of the ideas of things we were thinking about, wouldn't it be cool if there was a game that? And now we have those types of games. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, Fallout whenever Fallout wasn't quite where Fallout is. You know, we, we talked about Fallout before Fallout 4. And so now um, we've got Fallout 76 coming out. And uh, you know, we've made comments in the past, like, what if there was a Fallout MMO? Or what if there was a, you know, and, and now I'm finding myself eating my own words because I realize I really am not that interested in Fallout 76 for, well, for Fortnite reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, having that archive of our own thoughts, hundreds and hundreds of hours of our own thoughts is, is pretty cool because as we go back and listen to ourselves and who we used to be, as we talk about these things, we can see the evolution of our own um, selves as gamers, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, I, the, the truth is there's a lot of 12 year olds who started listening to us who are now, um, full-on adults and that's kind of weird uh well, 16 were, isn't quite yeah. a full-on adult <laughs> maybe in in gamer years i suppose but <laughs> hey they can buy m-rated games or is hormonally 17? 17. 17. they're adults <laughs> maybe i was speaking in gamer terms i was speaking m-rated games that's yeah. totally it <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I get, how about this then? There are 16 year olds who started listening to yeah, us who are now full go. on adults. Yeah, there you go. Myself included. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think my my kind of favorite um, episodes that we do or did were the uh, design choices series where we would talk about like, you know, let's just talk for an hour about open worlds and video games or, uh, you know, replayability in video games and just like kind of getting in nitty gritty on one single mechanic or idea yeah. in, in, a, in games in general and comparing and contrasting how certain games do that and kind of seeing what's kind of the best way to do this and in, in certain uh, depending on the circumstance. I agree. Um, some of those design talks, I think were some of our best talks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ones that we, we did did, we also did uh, episodes, and I think this is the ones that you're referring to, where we specifically would say, hey, we're going to try to design a game mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we would sort of just, just run with What's that What's our idea. ideal open world exploration game? That was like yeah. our last sure. episode, I think. And so on that note, we just wanted to go ahead and share, uh, like we alluded to at the beginning of the episode, uh, some of our thoughts, our tips, tricks, advice, whatever you want to call it, uh, for um, how we approach uh, games criticism, how we think about games, how we... Um, like, you know, as we're playing what we do or how we think in order to do what we do on the show. And so, I, first of all, I wanted to sort of share some further reading, so to speak. And I don't want to I don't want to give you guys this whole bibliography of like, OK, so here's all your homework for after you Boring. stop listening to the podcast. Um, but just a few key things that I really like that I think are really worthwhile and might be worth looking into if you're interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, and a couple of them we've already mentioned on the podcast before. Um, first of all, I think if there's one thing I could share, it would be uh, Theory of Fun for Game Design by Raf Koster. Um, it's I've a, never heard you say that I, I more than 10 times. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and just <laughs> I want, on a parting note, I just want to say that like, if you haven't read this book and you're interested in game design and how to think about games in a, maybe a different way than you've thought of yeah, before. change your thinking. Um, it's a really good book. It's really good. It really it's really is. short, very easy to read, full of like little fun illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of breaks down um, kind of like the, the, 
the biology, but also the psychology of um, games and why they're fun and why it is that we like them. And um, even from a design perspective, what you can do in your game or what questions you can ask to make the game more fun and more engaging. And um, it's played a lot into like even before I started citing it as something that like kind of um, crystallized for me some of my thoughts on games mm -hmm. um, things were like why isn't this system working and figuring figuring that out kind of in the terms that this book gives you um, is very very useful another one uh, on a related note this is also a textbook that would get assigned at a basic game design classes at UTD um, the art of game design a book of lenses by Jesse Shell that's S-H-E-L-L -L. I found that one. <laughs> um, very cool book. Uh, a lot more in depth and a lot longer than uh, Theory of Fun. Um, but what they do in that one is kind of give you uh, from a developer's perspective, too. And Raf Kostra, I think, is also a developer or at least a consultant now, if not still a developer. But Shell is actually a very experienced uh, game designer, and he also is a professor now. And he talks about um, these lenses that he uses as kind of ways to look at games and at your design, um, questions to ask again about um, how can I make this aspect of my game better? And I forget exactly how many lenses they're off the top of my head, but it's like... Several dozen, I think, at least. Yeah, I think it's 12. Um, no, not it's more than 12. <laughs> I can tell you that 20? for sure. 23? Oh, yeah. It's it's. Maybe over a hundred. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Um, well, there was a there was a companion sort of card set mm -hmm. uh, that were you could kind of like flip through them, yeah, flip and, through the lenses. Yeah. Um, and those are really cool as an, another way again to like maybe um, if you're thinking about an experience that you're going through or that you're playing um, to look through some of these lenses and start asking those questions mm -hmm. um, and about like you know how did they try to do this or um, if they didn't do this how could have they done it better that sort of thing. So um, definitely a book worth checking out. Um, and finally, uh, if you want something that's not quite so um, uh, wordy, <laughs> if you want something <laughs> a little bit more uh, visual and engaging, um, there's a YouTube channel called Game Makers Toolkit by Mark Brown. Um, and this is a really great channel. I've uh, actually been following it for a while. Um, you might know them if for no other reason than uh, the series Boss Keys, where they started off going through all the dungeons in the Legend of Zelda series and breaking down the designs and uh, kind of what makes them tick. He's a journalist, I think, uh, originally, and he sort of breaks down in kind of a way that I think is akin to our podcast and our way of thinking. These like really well informed, well researched and well thought out commentaries on uh, different subjects, for example, um, you know, if he's noticing a trend a couple of years ago, the rise of the um, what was it like the immersive system? I think it was kind of like the open world games like MGS five and games like that. The where The comeback of the immersive sim is what mm -hmm. he called that episode, I believe. Yeah. So all, all sorts of really great videos and it's ongoing and his uh, Patreon following is growing uh, quite a bit. Uh, and so there's uh, lots of funding to do lots of really cool stuff. So definitely. They just had uh, a game jam recently. That was pretty yeah, cool. Too. They, they host annual game jams around certain themes that are really neat. neat. So um, definitely worth following uh, Mark Brown and Game Maker's Toolkit. So kind of my personal list, and this is in no particular order. This is kind of stream of consciousness notes that I wrote down on kind of like what I would say. Um, the first one is to seek out new experiences, even ones you might not be interested in. Um, I think this is really critical in kind of expanding your thinking and getting to know why it is you like what you like and why you don't like what you don't like. Um, especially if you want to design games, I think just being aware of what's out there and understanding it on more than just kind of a theoretical level um, is really important for uh, growing in that way i would say play a game that you know that you're not going to like and be prepared to say why you don't like it after you're done mm -hmm. yeah this is something that when i was studying um film it was another point that was brought up is to not just look for movies that oh yeah i know i'm gonna like this because i like this sort of genre it's to broaden your horizons and, and watch things that you're not uh you, you typically wouldn't pick up so that you can examine them on a different level. Yeah. And I, I did this in this podcast too, and I'm glad you brought up that point. Um, cause it reminded me of just how much I got into, um, the mobile game side of it, just to kind of see what was out there and how much it's changed since the early, early days of mobile gaming mm -hmm. where, you know, developers are starting to figure things out. Now, of course there's certainly many, many, many games. I'd say the vast majority are still trying to nickel and dime people when it comes to money. Um, they really just trying to basically they're like slot machines trying to get more and more and more uh, money out of you. But there are actually some really good experiences in mobile gaming that I would have never discovered if I, you know, maintained my um, crotchety old, you know, retro gamer. <laughs> like, I'm never going to touch these these things. Um, so, I, I yeah, I, I think that's a great point to keep in mind. Just just reach out, play a game that you think you may not like. I did the same thing with actually Pokemon. I believe I played a little bit 
for the show to talk about it at one point when mm. I'd never played a Pokemon game. Uh, didn't really interest me, but um, went through and played it just to kind of see, hey, what's all the fuss is about? Why is this game so mm -hmm. popular and has stuck around for so long? Like, what's the deal with this game? Yeah, and I feel like that's uh, another point that we'll hit on here in a uh, bit. Uh, so next point that I would say is to, uh, in, on, on, on a related note, be aware of your preconceptions going into an experience. We actually had a full episode on this at one mm -hmm. point. Um, what do you expect? What do you want out of it? Uh, how does that affect what you do and don't like about the experience? And so, for example, if you go into uh, a game with really high expectations and it's just not what you're expecting, is it, does that mean that the game, it, it's probably disappointing by your definition, but is, does that mean the game's bad? You know, for example, right. like if you're looking at it objectively versus subjectively, I think that's something that's mm -hmm. worth uh, analyzing in yourself. Mm -hmm. And really the the state that you're in when you play a game, your your emotional state or your mental state or where you are in your life can really impact how the game makes you feel or what impact that it oh, has yeah. on you. Um, I only play zombie games when I'm in a certain mood. Yeah. And at the same, I mean, I sometimes I play intentionally. I'll go out and I'll play, um, you know, just a violent shooter when I feel like I need to blow off steam and do something that, you know, is a little more violent, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'll play something like Doom, I'll boot up, you know, the current current Doom system, or I'll play Doom on PSVR just to, oh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kill some demons. Mm -hmm. You know, I got I to gotta get in there and kill yeah. demons and feel, it makes, make, it just kind of to blow off steam. Another, another um, situation to kind of use a complete opposite emotional spectrum, um, several months back, uh, my grandfather died and it was a very emotional experience for yeah, me. Yeah, I remember. Um, I've been playing Dragon Quest XI recently, and um, I'll, I'll drop a minor spoiler, but it's not really a big one. One of the characters that you meet turns out to be the grandfather of the main character, oh. and they sort of have this little connection. And I feel like I wouldn't have really connected with that at all had I not gone through something similar. Uh -huh. So I, I think that when you play a game, it's important to, especially with your, the thoughts that you have about a game, to always remember that this is my perspective. and a game that you don't you don't particularly like like it's going to be somebody's favorite mm -hmm. yeah. and you don't know why it's their favorite yeah. and you know what they may not even know why it's their favorite yeah. so you should try to be respectful when you talk about that game and we, we give each other a lot of crap on the show because we know each other right. yeah. Yeah. but you don't want to go up to someone and they say hey this is my favorite game and you go well that game sucks <laughs> yeah. you know even strangers on the internet unless man. it's sonic right be civil <laughs> unless it's sonic of course <laughs> Your, I think your argument is incredibly strong, especially, you know, the the uh, violent game to blow off steam because you said the equal and opposite thing. Yeah. Um, whereas somebody who uses that as an excuse to play violent games every single day, man, you're breaking your brain. Right. But um, I'll just throw in this. The the last month or so, uh, I have been uh, on a, let's call it a, a media fast, including video games and other things. And whenever I came off of it, uh, I decided to do that by sort of reentering the, the game space with a game called uh, Zen Koi 2. It's a <laughs> mobile hmm. game where you just cause this little fish to go around and eat. And if you remember Flow mm -hmm. oh, yes. or Flower, it yes. feels a lot like like that kind of a game. And what you do is you, um, you, you level up your fish, you increase the size of your pond, and you eventually ascend into a dragon. And it's just, it's totally zen and you can't die and you can't, there's no, nothing backwards, but you're breeding koi fish. That's really what it comes down to. And you're like, oh, look, he's a, he's a pretty color and, and a pretty pattern. And you're trying to get the little achieves and stuff. Uh, it is monetized in the sense that you can uh, buy pearls and progress, or you can just go the nice slow route and look for them. And there are ways to get them in game, which is exactly what I've done. Mm -hmm. And man, the last three days I've just been in this Zen state with my games and it's been great. Yeah. And I definitely say like, you know, kind of know thyself, right? Because I think there are some people who might play hours and hours and hours of violent games that we might not enjoy ourselves, but they're able to handle it because it's just kind of like their disposition and like they might be like totally the nicest people in the world, totally not aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, I've had stints where I've played lots and lots of shooters or whatever else. And, you know, it didn't affect me on a personality level. Um, I don't think just because like I, I know sure. what I can and can't handle and, you know, I don't seek out anything that's like, you know, hyper violent, or whatever the case might be. And we've talked before on the show about how like there have been different studies that, you know, it, the science is still kind of unclear on all this. But there have sure. been studies that have shown that like video games don't actually um, like violent content doesn't affect you so much as, for example, one study showed um, a frustration uh, that games cause can actually make people more aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be that you're you get stuck in your koi fish game and suddenly you're a very angry, frustrated person. <laughs> and of course, that's going to depend too on how your own disposition is going to um, 
make you react to that stuff plays like into that, flow right? theory yeah. directly into flow yeah. theory and, speaking of which yeah you know, and, flowering. And, and, and right. it's just like one of those things too where like the video games it's just a medium it's just a right. thing you're doing right. and ultimately it kind of comes down to who you are as a person and what you need what choices you need to it, make for yourself it, it's like anything else where whether it's you know a book or a movie television series games are the same way that um they can and they should probably uh, you know affect you on some level whether it's um you know emotionally or intellectually or spiritually and if they don't it's probably not very good. Yeah, exactly. All story does that. Right. And then immersive story is going to do it on an even more a visceral level. Mm -hmm. And because it's immersing you in, agency is involved, and then flow theory kicks in. I mean, all of that. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, there's also something we're dancing around here in everything that we've said, and it's, it's simply this. Um, even a novel, if you think about the time investment in a novel, which is um, arguably not very interactive, um, I could make the argument that it was, sure. but, um, let's, let's just say that it's less interactive than a video game. The, the time investment in that is going to be, let's, let's go with an, an average read, which would be probably the equivalent of an audio book or something like that. Uh, 12 hours, 13 hours, maybe 19 hours, mm -hmm. right? For a really long book, it might be somewhere in the 23 hour mm -hmm. range. And some are short as like five and six. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, a video game, if you've only played 23 hours on a major blockbuster video game, you probably didn't beat it. Right. Uh, you're going to need to get up into the 80, 90, 100 for something like, say, Skyrim or Fallout or... Yeah, like six hour, that a six-hour game is considered like extremely short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so. <laughs> exactly. In fact, people complain about a $20 game that is only six hours, but we'll we'll pop 20 bucks on an audio book and listen to it for six hours and not complain. And that's interesting. So... To me, looking at it that way, I think that there is a huge uh, time investment uh, commitment, if you will. Um, I, I argued one time in a, in a previous cast about the idea of it stealing creative energy. Uh, playing video games steals creative energy. And, and I think the conclusion that we came to in that episode was it probably has more to do with a time sink. Mm-hmm you know that it eats your free time yeah just finding finding the balance in your life that works for you and like even if you're going through a phase where like maybe you don't need as much creative energy and what you feel like spending your time on is more games yeah. or um you know like i've mentioned for, like already in this cast you know like you know jim you mentioned for example trying to blow off steam a lot of times i don't find myself with the energy even to like want to <laughs> yeah. play something that yeah. intense especially if it's a new experience like i'll hop on overwatch especially with some friends and mm -hmm. like that's a very intense and high octane yeah. experience but it's also familiar um, kind of like trying to work up the energy. And this is actually something that Coster talks about is like the, the, the sort of what happens in your brain as you're trying to learn something new is actually a big part of fun, but also is, um, mentally taxing, yeah. um, potentially even emotionally taxing depending. Um, and so you just kind of have to know how to manage that for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to your point about games, potentially stealing creative energy, there are games that actually require creative energy to to play well, that's true like sure. minecraft or oh yeah um mm -hmm. any number of like games where you're supposed to draw the characters really or something like that. and i think some of the best some of the best ga better games at least that i've played have um done the opposite where they've inspired me creatively um oftentimes it's because i play them and i think oh it would have been better if they did x but still i think that that having that concept at least be an interesting one and presenting it in an interesting way and trying to take chances can in and of itself inspire you creatively mm -hmm. as well yeah it, creative it, problem solving I mean, that's what inspired this podcast thinking. pretty much mm -hmm. <laughs> well that's true yeah Continuing with the list, and this is something we've already touched on quite a bit uh be aware of your own thoughts and feelings while playing um so don't just play the game be kind of like aware of yourself playing it if that makes sense be like um, me there, there are sometimes <laughs> be an emotional wreck with every game that you play <laughs> well and not necessarily even that but like you know like there's there's immersion and sometimes like you guys have already said like you do get totally immersed in something and just sure. totally forget everything else yeah um but if you are trying to play a game to think critically about it you need to be a little bit detached and a little bit kind of like outside of yourself and able to observe what it is that you're thinking and feeling so that like when you think back on the experience, like, huh, now that I think about it, like when I was going through this part of the game, I was frustrated. And but I was also like a little bit anxious about other stuff that's happening in my life. And so maybe that was compounding um, that sort of thing. Uh, and even if you're not talking about like the meta sense, like other outside influences on you, just being aware of how you're reacting to stuff that's happening mm -hmm. in the game, I think is important. And in that sense, it's very much like creativity. Like if you if you are a painter or a sculptor or, you know, a writer, you're going to need to be able to come back in 
to the room, look at the piece that you've done and go, uh, no, that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. And be self-critical. Yeah. And that's an important part of being able to do that. So for us coming to the cast and being able to say, yeah, I enjoyed this game and here are the reasons why I did and why I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I totally get that this was a schlocky thing, but for me it was fun and here's why. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that requires that ability to step outside of yourself and, yep. and watch yourself, you know, playing the game. Mm -hmm. now, that's true of life in general. Just, yeah, it is. You know, well, it just makes you a better person. <laughs> yeah, basically, generally. basically what we're doing right now is we're giving you life advice yes. via video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What so. we're really saying. Who said video games weren't good for people? <laughs> Guys, backward compatible has just been this long con the entire time. We're actually talking about life. Yeah. We're actually forming a religion. <laughs> I, and Jim is our Jesus. I thought, yeah. I thought we weren't no, going to no. actually say that. I, no, I, I'm actually talking about your Facebook posts is what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. Think okay. about your okay. Facebook posts before you post them. That is yeah. what I am saying. <laughs> no, but I, I, think, I think that's great possible. advice and, and something that I, I found myself doing more and more just from the show, from um, my time with the podcast is reflecting more on games but after i play them mm -hmm. um i am definitely someone that is i'm sure you all have learned by now i get very immersed into games i get very immersed yeah. into um into films and, and books too but but for me games because of the interactivity they force me to stay involved the whole time mm -hmm. and um i don't have that time to reflect until after i'm i'm done but what i what i typically do is once i put the game aside um, I give myself that time to sort of reflect, okay, mm -hmm. what did I like about this? Um, why did this particular scene impact me as much as it did? And I'll stop and I'll think about it for a while. And that sort of, um, it kind of helps uh, crystallize those those concepts in my mind and, and yeah. helps me to maintain it and carry it forward. That's an interesting uh, thing because there are some games that are paced such that there's downtime in between moments of No, no, that's action. very true. And you could do that during a game as well. Yeah, right. like so, when, you're, when I'm grinding in Dragon Quest XI. You yeah, know, like, or, or like an Elder Scrolls game while you're yeah. walking from one side of the country to the other. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's like almost like the game is still going, you're still doing something, but it's a lull in yeah. the typical mm -hmm. um, gaming loop. Yeah, yeah, which is important to flow theory too, which mm -hmm. yeah, we, won't, we won't get into those weeds right now. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we probably have an episode about this sort of thing already, <laughs> actually. For sure. Um, so continuing on, uh, if you find you like or dislike something, think about why. Again, we've sort of touched on this already. Uh, what is the game doing specifically to create that feeling and why are you reacting the way that you are? How subjective or specific to you is your reaction? So, again, these are all kind of related. But, um, you know, I, I think that, like you said, Doc, you know, you get on here and you say, like, OK, so I realize that this game is blah, blah, blah. But I liked it because of this mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of analyzing in a very sort of practical sense. Um, one, like why it is that you are reacting that way. Um, is it because you had an expectation that maybe isn't being met or uh, maybe that's being exceeded in some cases? Or um, perhaps you uh, are, are seeing that like you, you see what the game was trying to go for, but like the mechanic just isn't quite working the yeah, way that you think yeah. it ought to or something well, like that's that. That's the way I felt about Horizon Zero Dawn. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a huge one for me. And, and I think that this is where I am as a gamer more than any other concept is I'm very self-aware about what my brain is doing and uh, what my body is doing and how I am reacting, um, you know, physically and viscerally to the media that I am consuming on all levels. And uh, in, in this particular case, the answer to your question, why am I enjoying a game? A lot of times has to do with the, uh, the, the dopamine serotonin cycle mm -hmm. and the idea of uh, loot boxes is really, really big right now. Um, and the reason why loot boxes work is because of that. It is quite literally that slot machine idea. Mm -hmm. um, and people, you know, certain countries are kind of keying into this and, and outlawing them and things like that. I mean, they, so at the EU just did a big thing against memes because memes use the same kind of a, a concept. It's, it's a quick hit that you didn't earn, basically. And so um, I'm keenly aware of this idea of anything that might be uh, in a predatory sense, kind of going after our, let's call it addiction tendencies, uh, gambling addiction tendencies with that idea of a, of a quick hit for f a feedback loop on, well, just one more box and I might get something cool. I might pull or just Darth one more Vader. turn in civilization yeah. five. Yeah. And see, that's the trick, right? Because like in game design, it's a really hard balance to strike between coming across as predatory versus what you are trying to do, which is to create a fun experience that is going to be keying into that cycle of, yeah. well, um, I yeah, mean, that's something a theory of fun covers. Is, I think you're giving credit mm -hmm. um, to the good mm -hmm. game designers who really are genuinely saying, mm -hmm. Hey, let's, let's create a great game. Yeah, yeah. But kind of on a related note, incidentally, you know, speaking almost more 
purely from a game design perspective. When there's a design decision you don't agree with, uh, see if you can puzzle out why the designer thought it was a good idea. Uh, perhaps it was the result of a lot Money. of other decisions. And let, let's and actually I, I mentioned that here for a second. So think of, see what reasons you can think of aside from lack of time or resources and then only consider those reasons as a last resort. The, the money and the resources and the time might be reasons a fair amount of the time, but trying to think past those is a good mental exercise. It might also get you thinking about how they went about solving those problems. Ask yourself what you might have done instead, then consider the implications of doing that. Does that cause a ripple effect into other parts of the design? Yeah, the equal and opposite principle of that, the positive way to look at that is let your limitations be opportunities. Uh, and I used to teach that as a core principle of game design, because if you set a limitation on yourself, such as, okay, we're doing this in 16-bit or modified 16-bit, then suddenly that becomes a, a really interesting challenge on how you're going to communicate information. Mm -hmm. And some of the absolute best uh, you know, sort of retro style, retro like games are those that have set limitations on themselves. I mean, uh, that's what the NES in early days of computing were. They had to deal with those yeah, limitations. Yeah, those were, those were real couldn't. limitations. Right. Yeah. Especially in like the world of music. Some yeah. of the old stuff and the solutions they came up with for, mm -hmm. for that are amazing. That's, yeah. that's often, Axiom Verge comes to mind yeah. though when we're talking that's, about it. Right. That's often been one of the criticisms that I've had about many um, of the newer AAA titles is mm -hmm. that they, um, are almost like um, examples of excess where they want to do everything because they, they have stop. yeah they have these huge yeah. budgets and so like you know Skyrim's a great example I think it's got really cool concepts really cool ideas there's really good things in the game but because there's so much there yeah it's such an unfocused experience yeah you got to know when to quit right and it could be so much more powerful if they had pared down what you can do um and focused on things that they felt they could do well. Yep. And you see that all the time in games now because yep. they have all this money to do it. And you see it, hell, you see it in sports games. They give you so many freaking options. I'm like, I just want to play the freaking game. And you can't because yep. you have like all these menus to go through, all these different modes of play. And sometimes, you know, you just have to recognize that less is more. Don't try to be something for everyone. Don't try to satisfy everybody. You know, think about who your audience is and you know, if this is the sort of game or this is the sort of statement that you want to make, go ahead and make it. But don't feel like you have to. I have to include this for this audience and I got to include this for that audience and I got to include this because you, you're mm -hmm. watering down the experience overall oh, for yeah. everybody. I think well, you'd be better off if you tried not to satisfy anybody. Except for yourself. Except for yourself, except maybe. Except for yourself. Yeah. 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 Oh. Even on a more granular level, though, um, having limitations set on any step of the process is important. Like. You wouldn't go into the art design for a game using an unlimited color palette because then it would turn into a total sure. cluster of, you know, sure. nothing. Mm -hmm. Or or you're you're coming up with enemies for your game. It's like, okay, well, anything could be an enemy? Really? Yeah. Well, no. There there are limitations based on your game world. Yeah. So there's always going to be limitations and yeah. so you have yeah. to be aware of that and if you just if you don't have essentially a game bible, you know, you throw everything out the window and you're like, I'm going to have all these different parts. Um, your game is unfocused, is going to be unfocused. And that doesn't mean that people can't have fun with it. Doesn't mean you're not going to have, an, you know, people aren't going to have interesting experiences, mm -hmm. but it, it may not have as much of an impact as it could have. Ultimately, that's the problem I have with games like Fallout and, uh, mm -hmm. well, Fallout 3 specifically, or sorry, Fallout 4 specifically, and, um, and Skyrim. It's that by the time I got around back to the main quest, any game with a main quest, I've forgotten what I was doing. Yeah. And it's been weeks since I've uh, played that part of the story, but I didn't want to miss any content. And so the most fun I had with Fallout 4 was when I went back into it with a fresh character playing a mother and was like, I'm going to ignore everything and I'm going to get my boy back. And I played for like five hours and had the answer to my question. And it was so freeing. It was so completely freeing that by the time I, you know, I, I answered that, it was like, it was so amazing. It was good. Yeah. And so kind of on this point, you know, kind of like thinking through, like if I was the designer here, how might I change things? And again, what are the implications of that? We actually did this really cool exercise one time in a game design course that I was the TA for where we were looking at the mobile game. And I think it started off as a flash game, Cannibalts, if anyone's ever played yes. that. Um, and basically it's a side, it's an infinite runner. You run on, you run to the right. You don't control your speed, left, like, you know, how fast you're going, except that you sort of gain speed over time. You can run into obstacles to slow yourself down. And you're basically jumping from rooftop to rooftop. And sometimes there are other obstacles that show up and you're just starting trying to see how far you can go, how long you can survive. And um, basically what we did is, is an exercise we asked, uh, what happens if we want to add a, um, a power up system to this? What the, might the power ups be? Uh, how would you collect them? What are the implications of those power ups? Um, 
and or you know say for instance like we just want to add an ability like we want to be able to double jump what does double jumping do to the game and you might find that that has implications on the level design because like there may be some jumps that are too easy or some now that are um like it, there's no challenge anymore unless you completely redesign your level generation system mm-hmm. um you know st- stuff like that kind of thinking through what does this mean to the game how does this change things um on a very sort of practical like systems design mechanical design level um and you can apply that to all aspects of the game from sound to art you know like we've mentioned to story um you know we've talked before and a lot of times, like I said, it does come down to kind of like time and resources available. But, you know, if you have a game where the game is a, a, it's about narrative choice and it's about choosing how your story goes, but then you run into the the problem of like, we can't make infinite branches. So how do we make a game that gives you the feeling of choice and gives the player effective choices without, you know, breaking the bank or just doing something that's literally impossible? You for map us to one achieve? choice to each of the four buttons <laughs> and everyone likes it. But Perfect. Jim. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so and that's that's the kind of the thing, too, is like, you know, so what is the solution? And sometimes you work through and you realize, like, they came up with the best solution I can think of um, until someone else comes out with a better idea or we sort of like take it from step zero and go in a different direction first and then come around to this or something like that. Like we maybe like they just did the best they could with this idea, given our tech and our time and whatever else. Um, and so that's an interesting exercise to go through. And kind of on a related note to that, I would say uh, be like that one kid in that one cartoon. I think it was like Animaniacs or something like that. The why kid uh, ask why. And then when you get an answer to the question, ask why again. And then just that's soccer going. teams you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <too. laughs> probably inspired by that. I do think that it leads to self-reflection so because it's always going to come back to your personal thoughts and your personal feelings and it it helps you understand um you know why do you think it's that way is really the question not necessarily why is it that way because Mm -hmm. you can never really you can't jump into somebody else's head yeah Mm -hmm. so say for example you've got a mechanic where maybe you find yourself wanting more options in this thing um why don't they give me more options well because the game actually isn't about this it's about this other thing and so if i want a game that's about having freedom in this area maybe i should play a different game or um you know okay so what if we did add more freedom in this subsystem Mm -hmm. then we might be running into feature creep but maybe it's actually really good for us maybe if we do expand this thing and sort of balance it out and make sure we get the pacing right Again, kind of asking the why behind all this stuff and kind of trying to come up with the even just the gameplay experience reasons behind things beyond just the challenges of development Mm -hmm. or the business challenges of the game. Like thinking just about on kind of like a a purist artistic level, like uh, just assume nothing else matters. Um, The play experience is all that matters. Um, How do we make this work and what's the best thing? Um, and kind of to round out my list here, and this is on a related note to a lot of stuff we've already talked about, uh, talk to other people or read what they write. Um, this is kind of related to seeking out new experiences. Try to understand other perspectives. This is something that was super valuable to me, um, throughout, uh, you know, undergrad graduate school, um, was being able to talk with other people about what we thought about our classes or about our projects that we're working on or about games that we're playing. Mm -hmm. Um, this podcast is basically that it came out of, um, a group of us going to the pub on Sundays. We were all in similar classes together and we would talk about stuff along these lines, not just games necessarily, but, you know, sort of hearing what each other had to say about different things and then being able to articulate to other people what our thoughts were. Um, and also being willing to listen just as much as you're willing to figure out how to speak, um, I think is extremely important is being able to get different perspectives on things. And sometimes you might just come to the conclusion that we disagree on this point, but at least understanding why they came to their conclusion. Yes. Um, I think is something that's very, very valuable. Well, and I think the flip side of that is having an opinion that is genuinely your opinion mm-hmm. and understanding why you have your opinion and what it would take to change your opinion. Mm-hmm. And, and instead of simply saying, I heard this thing this one time. So that that's what I think, mm-hmm. because uh, obviously that's true or whatever, or maybe not even getting that far. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it, instead of engaging in the echo chamber of loot box bad, um, understand why it is that maybe you think that, that loot boxes are bad, or maybe you don't think they are, and you disagree with that idea, then, you know, be be able to articulate why it is that you think that. Um, and, and I think I would summarize what you just said, Chris, um, by simply saying the phrase, stay compatible. <laughs> yep exactly <laughs> speaking of the uh, pubcast, by the way now might be a good time to release episode zero we'll see <laughs> release it 
<laughs> um, the fans want it. And, and so on, on this note of, um, you know, getting other people's perspectives and staying compatible, we wanted to close out this uh, final episode by sharing uh, a few of the games that we champion. These are games that, you know, aren't necessarily the best in any objective sense. Um, they're not necessarily kind of like the the games that every games critic or game designer must play or whatever. It's more just like games that we think are valuable that we really like and that we have like either before or we still do um pitch to people we like to say hey this is a game that i love for these reasons and i think you should experience this uh is there anyone who wants to start on their first one doc i'm gonna give you one chance to guess what my game is gonna be uh skyrim no oh. you're close it's morrowind oh, <laughs> i was about to say i should have known <laughs> uh yeah tell us about morrowind why should people play it um it's if skyrim was good <laughs> With worse graphics. And worse gameplay. But oh. everything else. Okay. Yeah. And by gameplay, I mean like combat and mechanics. So and why stuff don't like they that. just redo that one instead of re-releasing Skyrim a thousand times? Because Skyrim was more successful and it made more money and you can be a Nord who shouts at people and then they fall off a cliff. <laughs> That's true. There are dragons. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, why should I go back and, and play Morrowind? I, I think it is... One of the best, if not the best current examples of an open world RPG that gives the player freedom and still delivers satisfying story without there being um, cognitive dissonance or uh, ludo narrative dissonance. So when you say story, are you talking about the designer story or the player story? Both. Because um, I never, I've never, I would never think of Morrowind as a as being very strong on the designer story side i would say it's much stronger on the player story side but that's just my perspective i think um the so i think what morrowind does really well is actually ties them both in very uh very well granted there you know it's an aged game like the, not the whole thing is um voice acted they had a lot of limitations in terms of graphics because it was it came out and you know they were developing it in the late 90s it didn't come out until 2002 i think um but the uh the story um you know just like the plot and everything is is interesting but like even aside from that just the way that they mechanically weave in um for example uh one of the main criticisms of skyrim that doc and uh i believe you have even uh said on the podcast before is that you find yourself going in the main quest um and then stopping to do some other side quest and it doesn't make sense that the world just kind of stops on a dime for you. Mm -hmm. Like you're in the middle of, you're about to go fight, uh, Alduin, uh, and you decide to go pick butterflies up from the flowers and just, you know, hang out for a little while. Or worse yet, go happens. become the Dean of the magical university. Yeah. Yeah. Even though you're a barbarian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That <clears> makes perfect sense. Morrowind or or the the head of the thieves guild <laughs> right working all those dos <laughs> or trace or yeah <laughs> yeah be all um, the things or los cuatro so <laughs> on and on and on <laughs> yeah um but what morrowind does is it severely limits um what you're allowed to do based on how you design your character from the beginning your class um you you know you have skills and you can't join uh certain factions unless you have skills that pass a certain level and you can't level up in those factions unless your level skills are like you know you have to have a level 60 destruction skill mm. to become the wizard rank rather than the mage rank so, in the in the mages guild so it encourages replay yeah it encourages replay and it also encourages um character specialization rather than just becoming a jack of all trades and doing absolutely everything because you're the dragonborn um you're a character not a superhero right yeah, because that's the thing. That's one of my criticisms of Skyrim as well, is that you're you are not a hero on a quest. You are a superhero. You can be yeah. the best at everything. And it just doesn't feel the, right yeah. in this setting. Over overpowered. Yeah, we we even talked about how like narratives can detract from open world games in an entire episode relatively recently. And one of the things mm -hmm. we said was the kinds of stories that make for good games are not the kinds that are urgent and require the player to go um you know immediately s save people from the danger you know like breath of the wild is a good example where like yes it's kind of an urgent thing but everything you're doing as link when you get out of the shrine of resurrection is training to fight ganon and mm -hmm. that's the goal um 
what Morrowind does is pretty interesting where uh, you don't have to actually start the main quest and like you, you, you get to a point in the main quest where the guy who's kind of overseeing you is like, all right, look, we need you to do the super important mission for the for the Empire. But right now, everybody knows that you're an outlander and they're not going to trust you. And you 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 need to build up your reputation. They actually have a reputation stat in Morrowind for that reason, so that you past a certain point, if you if your res- if your reputation is too low, you literally can't move on through the main quest because you need to have uh, the trust of the people. So what he tells you is before I send you on this mission to go do this thing, you need to go join one of the factions and you need to go, you know, help people out in, around the town and make a name for yourself so that people trust you because you're an outlander and you look like it. Um, and I think that alone, you know, makes the game a lot more immersive because one, it encourages you, the player to have a unique player story because all of a sudden now you're go you're going and joining one of the factions that maybe your friend didn't join, even though you're both doing the main quest from the get go. Um, and two, it's preventing the Ludo narrative dissonance that, that was one of the main criticisms of Skyrim. So um, and then there are other things about Morrowind that's like, you know, they don't get, they don't hold your hand as much like the newer Elder Scrolls games. And there's more of like an immersive feeling of exploration and the magic system is better and uh, it's a cooler setting than the rest of the Elder Scrolls games. I could go on forever, but I think the main thing is like, yeah, it does open world RPG, right? Mine is to go in a completely different direction. Um, I had a lot of games when I was thinking about this topic in advance that I could have chosen. And um, I actually think I'm going to pick one that's a little bit less conventional, although I do believe it's one that most people have played. uh, And that is Tetris. And the reason I bring Mm. up Tetris is because um, even if you've played it, you should go back and play it with a different mindset. Um, Tetris has been called before the perfect game. And the reason it's been called the perfect game is not because it's the best at everything. Yeah, that was episode 12 you said that, I believe. Yeah. I, I've said it before, but it's not just me. It's 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 been referred to as the perfect game. <laughs> I'm joking. Right. But one of the reasons that it has been is because of, um, we talked about limitations earlier, and it is a game that knows exactly what it's trying to be. Yes. It is a puzzle game in which there are only a few controls. There are only a few things mm-hmm. you can do. The blocks you can rotate the blocks and you can move the block on the screen from left to right. And you can also click uh, down to speed up or instantly drop the block into place. And that's it. That is all you can do in the game period. Once the game starts, that's it. However, despite that being all, all that you can control, the game is actually um, provide is actually very challenging and very gratifying in order to, you know, when you actually successfully not just create create lines, but you build up um, combos, you set it up to get a Tetris, which is, um, mm-hmm. you know, what is it? Five lines? Four. Four lines. Yeah. Thank four you. is the maximum. Uh, yes, four yeah. lines. I don't know why I blanked on that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, four lines all at the same time is a Tetris, uh, but also getting triples, doubles. You know, you're trying to beat your own your own scores, but you're also trying to get as far as you can in the game. Um, one of the things to think about when you go back and you play Tetris is... And it kind of builds off of what Chris was saying before with Cannibal. How would you improve Tetris? Because it's been tried many times. Yeah. Many have tried. <laughs> have you ever played Tetris Two? Oh yeah. Have you ever played? Uh, you know, there there was Tetris Two. There was Tetris World. Doctor Mario. Tetris Sphere. Uh, I'm just talking about the Tetris imp- quote improvements. Oh, I know, but they were all but spin-offs. Then, yes, and then there's the the quote spinoffs or, or other puzzle games that have tried to capitalize on this phenomenon of Tetris, no like Doctor Mario. No one has ever been able to do it. And then there's even Puyo Puyo Tetris, which is a mashup, which is kind of different. That one's fun. But no one has been able to create a another puzzle game that has the longevity of Tetris. We talked a little bit about about Bejeweled. No, but but, hold on. We've (laughs) talked. We talked earlier about games like World of Warcraft. That oh yeah, they've been playing it for twenty years. Or Mm -hmm. we talked about say Fallout seventy six. You're like oh we're we're gonna play this forever. Tetris. People play this. Have been playing this game since it came out. Mm -hmm. It is a consistent. Now it's been re-released multiple times people will argue about which version is better obviously there are different versions but have that have almost identical gameplay but with slight tweaks of course there's slight differences but all the attempts to improve tetris to change the gameplay mechanics or add new buttons have not worked 
So anything that anything that people do to try to overcomplicate it hasn't worked. And, yeah. and one thing to, to consider, and I'm not you know going to give all the answers. I don't think that's something that that there is one answer to. It's something for you to think about on your own. But that is, you know, why why hasn't there been a way to improve this game, or at least why hasn't it worked? You know, why why do people that try to come up with a way to improve it fail, yeah. or at least create a version that might be fun for a little while but doesn't ever replace the original experience right i would argue that tetris is one of the few objectively perfect games that's exactly yes and that's what i was saying and yeah. it's not just us saying that many people have made that argument um and i think one of the reasons for it is because of how how little you can actually do they are able to focus in on making that experience well perfect or as close as perfect as you can be because mm-hmm. there are so few things you can do yeah. as you start adding on more um, ways to interact with the game and it's not just more buttons but more things that you can do it becomes more and more difficult to make each of those elements work that's together right. that's right and that's what makes tetris such a great experience i remember on my game boy when i got tetris mm-hmm. and um and i'm talking the original yes you know monochrome uh, the one that ate the batteries mm-hmm. like crazy <laughs> and what i remember uh this moment it was sort of my moment for tetris where i realized you could do the spin maneuver and the slide maneuver, and yes. those were two separate things. And and so it's like there's this brief mm, second after it's, quote, on the bottom when you can still move it yes. and get it into position. Mm-hmm. And that changed everything for me. And then that moment where physics says, listen, you can't rotate this block, but you can. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's little, there's little tricks in Tetris. And I say there's only a few controls, but they... And that's a great example of it. There are little little things that you can do that at first are not immediately apparent. But they're always there. They've but they're always, always been there. It's an early example of emergent gameplay. Yes. Yes, and it it's also one of the reasons why when they brought it onto, say, mobile, it didn't work as well. Yeah. And there's something to be said for needing that original NES controller um, layout. It doesn't have to literally be an, an NES yeah. controller, mm-hmm. but it has to be that layout in order for it to really... I can't really play Tetris on a joystick feel at all. Right. Exactly. No. Exactly. And and there's something to that. Um, but I, I think, I think you're onto something, Jim. I think mm-hmm. that there's something so just seminal about that game mechanic yeah. that you can't, you can't dilute it anymore down. You can't make it simpler than it is. And, and, and yet at the same time, you can't um, make it more complex without sort of d- diluting it or breaking it. Yes. Um, it is, it's in its perfect space of it works the way it does. Now you can you can start changing the parameters. Yes, and higher it, level goes faster. You've got trash that you need to clear, et cetera, et cetera. And many et cetera, of them have. But, and there are there are even within within the original Tetris, there are a couple of different modes yeah, where you have yeah, the the you know quote clear the trash mode basically, mm-hmm. which was there were already some blocks in place. So there were there were two different modes in Tetris as well. Yeah, there were. Um, both of them work, but they all have they they have the same mechanics. It's just a matter of the difficulty level. Yeah. Did you ever beat it? Did you ever did you ever get all the characters on screen? The oh, oh, yes, you mean and, the original? Yeah, um and get to Nessar level Game what Boy was it twenty or whatever it was. Yes, I have. And the rocket goes up, and mm-hmm. Link's playing his fiddle, and every all the other characters are there. <laughs> many years ago, one time I was able to do yeah. that. It's one time. It's very challenging, but I think, many many years yes, ago. But yeah. with with Tetris, it's not even to me. It's not even about beating it. It's about recognizing recognizing the game for what it is yeah. and just i i think it's it's a lesson it it, it teaches you that limitations yeah help with game design yeah. and that's something that yeah. i that i feel like you we can say that all day but most but when someone especially no, that's, that's very real yeah, you you've seen this in your classes where people want to when they come up with a game idea they want it they want to throw everything at it yeah they do they're like oh i've got all these great ideas i want to put all of my great ideas into this one game mm-hmm. yeah and tetris teaches you well hold on a second Focus on just the one idea. Yeah. And how can I make that one idea great? And yeah. if I can do that, then you've got a great game. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, it's been said that some of the best game systems, games in general, game mechanics, whatever you want to call them, the best ones are the elegant ones, and the elegant ones are the things that can accomplish multiple things for your game. Solve two problems at once yeah. or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two or more problems mm-hmm. at once. Speaking of Mark Brown, he had an entire episode about dual-purpose design. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he used the game Downwell as an example. Mm-hmm. One of several, yeah. Where everything... I in... do not like that game. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Um, it, you can't say it's a bad game. No, though. it's not. It's yeah. just I'm terrible at it. <laughs> yeah. No, so am I. <laughs> Everyone's terrible. There, there, at there it. are many games I'll look at and be like, oh man, I love that design. Oh my God, I can't play that yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Tetris was the game that uh, I first got into the zone with. Hmm. It, it's the first game that I realized could change my, my thinking. It's the first game that really took me to an altered state of mind. And at the same time, it is also the first game where whenever I was out and about in the car, in the back seat, and mom and dad were driving and I looked out and I saw buildings. Then I saw these imaginary tetrads mm-hmm. falling from the sky to fill in the space. And I went, oh crap, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and that, that changed, that was, that might, that might actually be my moment that where I realized I was a gamer is whenever I was not even playing a game, but I looked out the car window and, and saw those tetrads falling in my imagination mm-hmm. and realized this is in me forever now. Like a fungus <laughs> or a parasite. So I've got several games and these are all you relatively time recent. For several games. Yeah, no, I'm, One not, game. I'm not. But um, I've got, <laughs> if I had to narrow it down between those that I find myself most excited to share with people, like if it's ever on sale or if, uh, you know, it's, it's available for free somehow or something like that. I'm like, guys, if you haven't played this, go play it. And not even because it's the best game ever or even because it's the best at what it's trying to do just because I, I loved those games so much. And so I think the one, if I had to narrow it down, at least for the moment, it would be Tales from the Borderlands. Um, really? Yeah. We talked about this on an episode a while back. Yeah, it was um, one of my favorite episodes. And I've said before, I said in that episode that I think it's the telltale story game model done at its best. I agree. Um, and I think what's fascinating about it is because it, first of all, it's funny. And especially if you're a fan of the Borderlands universe, um, it's Which just, you are, yep. It's got just like great, great comedy, great energy. Um, actually really solid storytelling though. It has like that really great balance of Borderlands at its best of having serious storylines with a lot of comedic skin on top, mm-hmm, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And so it's, it's just a really fun story overall. Canonizes your decisions mm-hmm. in really neat ways. Yeah. Rewinds time in really neat ways. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say is that I think of all the games that understanding that story games as they exist right now are fundamentally limited um we only have the ability to do so many branches practically speaking Mm -hmm. um and there are some games that kind of go in these interesting procedural directions but they don't like anything that gets too procedural i think starts to miss out on um kind of like good like developer plot yeah if that makes sense um and so to be fair mm -hmm. it was it was chapter oriented so Mm -hmm. people played it and then there were reactions Mm -hmm. and they voted and the the devs got to see what players had actually Mm -hmm. done in context and were able to adjust the story accordingly and that's huge which is interesting yeah and i think too that like you know you go back and you play it a second time you'd realize just how little some of your choices mattered yeah but as far as making the magic of feeling like your choices do matter the first time through um and this is after several other games i've played including like the walking dead season one like any good GM. um you know I, i've talked a lot about the mass effect trilogy and how much i loved that one my first time through um this one even after having been if you want to call it this way disillusioned by how limited these games are um still managed to make me feel like I had some control on the story um, because it, it, to a certain extent you, you did mm-hmm, more yeah, so than the other games. more so than the other games. Yeah. And I think one of the key things they did throughout is they took more opportunities, even in meaningless ways to, to show you that your decisions were noted. Mm-hmm. Um, we gave the example at one point of when um, you switch perspectives between cu- two characters and just before you switch perspectives, you're trying to figure out how you want to con someone. And so it's like, do you want to go with story A or story B? Uh, you went with story B. And so then we switch to the other character. It's like rewinding like 30 seconds or whatever. And you're walking up on this conversation that's happening. And conversation B is the thing that you're hearing. Um, just little things like that. Um, where there's a choice that was reflected in the game and you know that it's reflected, um, just really made you feel like uh, you were taking part in the story and that your decisions were mattering. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, like really great story, really great comedy, super enjoyable. It's a short enough game that you can get through it and enjoy the whole experience, all five episodes. And like, I think each episode is like two or three hours, maybe. And so five chapters is going to be like 15 hours overall, which is longish by some standards, but, you know, not very long by most. Um I would definitely say, given that especially you can probably get it really cheap these days, um, worth checking out. Even if you're not a fan of story games, I think it's one of the best story games that's been done in this style. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, I, and I would agree that um, the lesson there, and, and it's a lesson that you can learn um, in a few other of the better Telltale games, but that's you know one of them, is you need to, you need to give the players the illusion of choice mm-hmm. and not, 
not over design the choices to the point that um you know there there's a level of giving players choice in any sort of narrative game that behind the scenes they might have no choice but they won't they won't see it so mm-hmm. you're putting in all this extra work for no reason and i think that's something that um some of the worst telltale games have gotten wrong mm-hmm. whereas either you see through it right away yeah. and you can tell oh this is not really a choice or and other games do this too they give you all these choices but if they don't actually have an impact it doesn't really matter mm-hmm. and you've created all this and then the developers created all this content and you lose that focus that I, you know i talked about earlier um you sort of go off your focus and you spend all the extra time and resources on all these different paths. So then you can, you can trumpet how many different paths there are, but at the end of the day, the use to the user, it doesn't feel like it's any more choice than they're getting in say tales from the border. Right. Yeah. So I, I do think that is an important lesson, especially yeah. playing the game and then looking at that, like a flow chart maybe afterward right. and seeing, Oh, here's what all the choices actually are. Oh, I guess there wasn't really that many choices, but it was reflected in the game to make me feel as though mm-hmm. I had all this choice. Oh, that's really clever mm-hmm. how they did that right. to kind of recognize that. One of the, one of the things that makes like that I hate the most about story games is when you, when you have more than one dialogue option, but you can tell after picking one of them that the, player would have, or that the character would have responded the exact yeah. same way no fallout, yeah. fallout way. 4 it's it's the yeah. it's the flavor the false you, or so. mass effect does this too some of yeah. the like, you're you're Legend putting Zelda. <laughs> yeah you're putting a flavor on what you say you're not really making a choice yeah. right yeah you know I, I, firewatch comes to mind actually there are no meaningful choices in firewatch at all the story is simply being told but there is a headcanon element of how you reacted and what you know the character has done up to that point that colors the ending Mm -hmm. and changes things for you as the player and ultimately that's all that matters Mm -hmm. whether there's a setting or not a setting in some system database somewhere irrelevant if your reaction to it as a player takeaway is like wow that was dark versus wow that was really cool just because of the things you said and that's really interesting to me. So I recommend, highly recommend Firewatch, but that's not my answer. Mm-hmm. That's not my answer. Um, as tempting as my uh, answer is to go with Fallout and Fallout 2 because of isometric, because of world building, because of uh, how you tell a story without dialogue, because of... It sounds like you're already going I know, them. right? And, I, and, and, <laughs> the answer is Fallout 3. I got it. <laughs> but, but, and that's actually a really good point is because, you know, then it evolved into this thing that was this first person thing. But I'm going to ditch the ditch the Fallout universe and and go in a completely different direction. And this is kind of strange, but my answer is Minecraft. Mm, really? Yes. It's actually not that surprising to me. And the reason why my answer is Minecraft is not because I think everyone should be forced to play some Minecraft. I honestly don't care if you play Minecraft, but you have to understand Minecraft. Mm. It is completely true to say that Fortnite would not exist if not for the Minecraft phenomenon. Mm-hmm. A what, lot of games would not exist. That's if not very for true too. Yeah. But but the thing is, Fortnite's big right now, so yeah. I'm using it as an yeah. example. The battle royale thing was an afterthought right. because of PUBG. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and and it's funny because if you look at some of our conversations on the cast, I, I remember the episode, Chris, where you brought up PUBG and you were mm-hmm. like, it's this thing. And I'm like, that's so weird. That would never happen. Mm-hmm. And I remember making a statement and being completely wrong that Hunger Games could never be made into a video game. Totally wrong. Um, especially in a comedic setting like Fortnite, right? Uh, where everything's a little bit bouncy. It's kind of like it's all made of rubber or whatever. Oh, yeah, everybody's it's fun. dancing all Yay, the time. Yeah. You know, we shot each other. It's so cool. It's a party bus. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what, a battle bus. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the thing is, though, that what, what Fortnite was supposed to be was go kill zombies and build things and get plans and that sort of thing. And it's still technically there, but nobody talks about it. You can't even find Let's Plays of that mode. It's really, really funny. We should make a Let's Play of that mode. I know, right? <laughs> um, be but, the only ones doing. But all that exists because of this idea of going into a procedurally generated world, which is blocky and cubey and kind of uh, feels retro, but it's still 3D and you can just make stuff and try to survive. And that was the original idea. And there was like, I don't know, 12 different types of blocks. And then it evolved and it evolved some more. And people were like, wow, I wish this was multiplayer. And uh, they went, okay, let's make it multiplayer. And then suddenly it just rocketed into this whole other thing. We had a server, we played in beta. Uh, I built Hogwarts Castle in one-to-one scale uh, using survival multiplayer and digging every single bit of resource out. Then Sandstone 
was put into the game and I went and I redid like half of it because it was so much prettier. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's how this worked. I mean, did all the dungeons, did everything. Um, and, and that was my experience, but I don't think anybody needs to have my experience in order for the game to be good because beyond that, I actually watched more YouTube videos of Minecraft, mostly thanks to uh, the Yogg's cast, Simon and Lewis and Shin and Duncan and Martin and all those guys who had done these crazy things in all these different created worlds. They they ran uh, Shadow of Israfel, which they never finished because they're bums. And uh, they were running RPGs inside of Minecraft. And it just it blew my mind that you could do this in this space. And, um, uh, that spawned the, the lab venture stuff that I did, uh, and is all archived now at one point where I had a class that was, was doing that kind of a thing. And they ran a full, uh, dungeon run that, that I had created with a, uh, uh, one of my uh, TAs at the time. It was so good. Shout out to Russell, by the way. Excellent job. Uh, mm-hmm. and then beyond that, you've got the adventure mode, which was put in, and now you've got um, you know the programmable boxes. And Minecraft is almost unrecognizable from what it originally was with creative mode and everything else. Um, but for all those things to exist as this movement, there is there's such a cultural phenomenon behind it that when I finally got to that point where I realized not only was it my guilty pleasure game but it was also a stigma game (laughs) and also only kids were playing it because I'd been playing it for so long that the kids had grown up and given it up and I hadn't. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a shame because like, I think that stigma came about just because of like Minecon happened and there was all those like, quote unquote cringe compilations of mm. kids doing and like, annoying stuff and like lots of like 12 year old let's players on youtube and, yeah but yeah. like what do you expect when you've got a bunch of 10 year olds all in a in a hotel mm-hmm. yeah you know so and like, i didn't know anything about that i mean yeah. i literally yeah. didn't know anything I about think that's that no i like never, one of the I've main contributors of, of to the to the I, i've always had a negative perception of minecraft and i never even heard of minecon until mm. much later yeah <laughs> um i think it's more just the, the style of game hasn't been for me but would you say doc i know you're a big lego fan as well would yeah, you say sure. that minecraft is more of a Lego game than any of the Lego licensed games. Uh, until Lego World came until out. Lego, yes, yeah. until Lego, but Lego would, World took so. after Minecraft, right? Yeah, it, it, well, it kind, in of, a way, it in kind a way. of did, but um, they... It did only because it's a creative game that came out after Minecraft, yeah. so it had to have... The granularity... Know, I just mean Lego Lego games were around for so long, the, the and all of them were just... The granularity of being able to Lego. actually build a thing um, yes. in any kind of intelligent or meaningful way mm-hmm. simply wasn't there. You guys right. are they, sleeping on Lego Creator, my dudes. That wasn't... Well, that's that's true. The old, old Lego game. That yeah, got phased rate. out. Yeah, that got yeah, completely no. phased out because it just simply didn't work. The thing of the weird thing about Lego games is they do story really, really well, ironically, um, because they mm-hmm. can parody yeah. uh, all major right. things like right. Star Wars. But and it's Indiana but it's Jones nothing like the experience and, of playing with the bricks, right? Whereas yeah. Minecraft, because of that building element, you the building cannot aspect. virtually simulate the click of taking two bricks and pushing them together with your finger True. Yeah. and the the the, the Time to 10 get year old sensation of sticking it in your mouth and trying to get it apart again you know what i'm saying you just can't the or, the, or the adult sensation of stepping on them barefoot oh <laughs> or vacuuming them i got a four-year-old man don't yeah um so I, I think that minecraft was what it was because it didn't have pegs you know there were no studs yeah. in Minecraft. You can quote me on that. Wait, uh, the, the, there were no studs in Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, but that's the, that's the only idea of a one I never meter played. block uh. being your your level of granularity, and you're like, okay, I'm going to go make Neuschwanstein Castle. How do I do that? <laughs> well, okay, so there's going to be a meter's worth of stick outedness, and you've got like this three meter thick wall in order to have any kind of relief at all, and then just it, it changes it changes everything about the way we were thinking about. Um, building stuff in virtual spaces. And I think it has affected a generation in that regard to understand that we don't have to have high definition detail. It's just, we don't need it. We we can still get it and understand what it is. You know that, that as an official downloadable mod map, Skyrim exists in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's licensed. I mean, there was lots of knockoff stuff, but that, that was actually run through the algorithms to get it as close as they possibly could as a cooperative effort between the two teams. Mm -hmm. That's mind blowing (laughs) or mine blowing. (laughs) (laughs) And, and they even populated it with the NPCs. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. So uh, yeah, that's my answer. Minecraft. Um, I can never go back into alpha and have that experience I had in alpha playing 
I can never be in beta again. I can never um, go back into my old server again. Um, it, it will never exist the way that it did. So there's a nostalgia factor there that I, I've tried to recreate a few times, get a server up, stuff like that. Nobody showed up. I've been playing a server, Minecraft no one a little came. bit it was lately, sad. actually. Um, after th there was an update in August mm -hmm. that added a bunch of new features. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if I'm getting quite the same nostalgia factor, but I'm enjoying my time Interesting. with it. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way and tie it into Jim's point. Minecraft alpha, in a sense, maybe beta, maybe release. You can make your argument on when you got into it. It was Tetris. And now we're in the Tetris 2, Tetris 3, <laughs> Dr. Mario, uh, Poyo Poyo era of Minecraft. You know what I'm saying? Right. Is that we've added so much junk to it and now it's modded and you've got tech it and you've got the, you know, feed the beasts and all that. And all that stuff's now nostalgic and old that, <laughs> that in order to a ask yourself, what's the pure Minecraft experience? It simply doesn't exist anymore. There or, was never a pure Minecraft experience because my favorite yes. time was maybe like beta. Yes. But other people will say, oh, wait, it was before they added sandstone. That yes. ruined everything. <laughs> yes. And so my point is this. There is no definitive Minecraft experience. In order to understand Minecraft, you have to understand its ev evolution right. from the beginning and to sort of have been a part of it. I don't like the punk rock movement. Yeah. Um, and, and then that sense, which I was not. Um, and in that sense, it makes me sad because I can't pull out Minecraft the way I can pull out right. Tetris and just have an afternoon of Tetris mm -hmm. or an afternoon of Minecraft. Uh, it just can't do it. You can open up old versions like they have them all archived now. I could get but the But it's disc. not quite the same. I could get, I could get the PS4 release yeah. and just get, get, grab that and that would work. But right. it wouldn't be the same. I always played on PC. Um, that I always played on PC. Yeah. So anyway, cool. that's my answer. And with that, dear listeners, I think it's about time for us to start signing off. So uh, thank you for joining us for these four years of the backward-compelled.com podcast. And the last thing we talk about is Minecraft of all things. <laughs> <Right>. Yes! <laughs> uh, Doc's I win! Goal. I win! If you, if you don't want to uh, end on quite that note, feel free to go into our backlog. And uh, like I said... You know what, Chris? You should edit the podcast so that Minecraft comes before the rest of them. There you go. <laughs> and we end on Morrowind. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, anyway, uh, the podcast has gotten ended at some point. That, and that was a no from him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> this, this is the point we're ending on. So, uh, thank you again, dear listeners, for joining us. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Nick. I'm Doc. And so we see you again. So long.